Hello, a very warm welcome to our Women in Cog event today. My name is Sharon Peacock and I'm Professor of Public Health and Microbiology in the University of Cambridge and Director of the COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium. I'm really delighted that Dr Maria van Kerkhoof has agreed to be our guest today. She would already be familiar to many of you, but I'd like to say a few words about Maria's role and background. So Maria is an infectious disease epidemiologi uh, ep epidemiologist and the COVID-19 technical lead at the World Health Organization. Maria specializes in outbreaks of emerging and re-emerging pathogens. And in addition to her appointment as the COVID-19 technical lead, Maria is also the head of the Emerging Diseases and Zoonoses Unit within the WHO's Health Emergencies Programme. Maria's main research interests include, include zoonotic, respiratory and emerging and re-emerging viruses such as avian influenza, MERS-CoV, Ebola, Marburg, Plague and Zika. She's particularly interested in investigating factors associated with transmission between animals and humans and the epidemiology of zoonotic pathogens and ensuring research directly informs public health policies for action. Maria completed her university degree at Cornell University, then she did a master's at Stanford University and then a PhD in infectious disease epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Prior to joining the WHO, Maria was the head of the Outbreak Investigation Task Force at Institute Pasteur's Centre for Global Health, where she was responsible for establishing public health rapid response teams for infectious disease outbreaks. She was previously employed by Imperial College in London in the MRC Centre for uh, Outbreak Analysis and Modelling, where she worked closely with WHO on influenza, yellow fever, meningitis, MERS-CoV and Ebola. She steeped it clearly in uh, uh, the background that would lead her to be a real expert in uh, pandemic preparedness and, and outbreak response. So a very warm welcome to you, Maria. So Maria is going to be in conversation today with Dr. Catherine Ludden, who for the last two years has been the operations director for COG UK and is director of COG Train, which is a global education program. They're going to be in conversation, but uh, for the last 10 minutes, we're going to have a Q&A prior to closing at one o'clock. So a few comments about, about uh, Zoom etiquette. You will remain on mute and off camera. Um, you can place your questions in the Q&A box in, in your screen. We'll pick these up and ask them. Uh, uh, we'll try and get through as many as we can, depending on time. So we'll be recording this event and it will be posted in a week or so on our COG UK website. So with that, I would like to hand over now to Catherine and to Maria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sharon, and, and thank you, Maria, for, for joining us today. I've, for everybody in the audience, I've heard Maria speak many times, and each time I'm, I'm full of admiration for everything you've done, not just over the, the last two years, but in your, previous, in your previous history of your career. And I think you're a role model to everybody, so I'm really looking forward to hearing your story and for everybody to have the opportunity to ask questions at the end. And I think as, as we normally do at Women in Cog, it's really good to get a flavour of, of where it all started. Um, so I think a good place would be, you know, what really got you interested in science? Was there a role model? I've heard stories about you being given a book on the hot zone from Ebola and this stirred your, your career, but really was that beginning or was, there, was, there, was it before that? Make sure I unmute. So thanks for having me and thanks for that really nice welcome. Um, and I'm really happy to be here with you today. I think it was funny that you said in my previous career, I feel like I had a previous career before this pandemic even began. It's, it's like a lifetime ago. Um, I've always been interested in science. Um, I think when you become a scientist, I don't know when the actual start date of that is. Um, I was always fortunate to have really incredible teachers uh, growing up in upstate New York. Um, and some of my favorite classes involved science and math. So I always sort of leaned towards those types of um, uh, disciplines. I have a twin sister and she, she focused more on the arts and I focused more on the science. So it's really kind of interesting that we, that we had the, that, that balance. But in high school, I had a really, one of my wonderful teachers, uh, Mr. Peter Goodfriend um, taught AP biology and he taught anatomy and I loved those classes. And he had like this really infectious nature of which he spoke, forgive the pun, but um, it was just a joy. It was just a joy to be, be part of. 
And around my senior year of high school, um, I was starting to read books uh, around infectious disease outbreaks. And one of the books I read was The Hot Zone. That book didn't you know, get me interested in science. I think it was reported in one of my previous interviews that was that was what triggered me. And it wasn't. The book was interesting because um, there was an outbreak of Ebola in Kikwik uh, in 95. And you know, growing up in, in the US, you didn't hear about these things very much. And I remember reading about it and, and thinking, you know, not really understanding so much about infectious diseases. And so I wanted to read as much as I could. And at the time, there were a bunch of books that came out, The Hot Zone, um, Virus Hunters. And it was all about, you know, these incredible scientists, all men, uh, you know, who studied and, you know, sought to investigate these pathogens. And I remember reading the books, which were quite um, dramatic, you know, in the way that they're written, of course. And I looked at the different disciplines in, of the characters in the book, of these real people in the book. Again, most of them were men. Most of them were virologists or clinicians, but there were some who were epidemiologists. And it was the first time I had learned about the word or the profession as epidemiology. And I became quite interested in that. And I loved the idea that you could have these viruses, these pathogens that could be benign in animals but you know, spill over, and I didn't know the word spill over at the time, or you know, spill over into people and harm some, but not others. And I just became really interested in this notion of diseases and infection and outbreaks. And I don't know, it's quite a fascinating field. So it just, I think it, it feels like it was very natural. It didn't feel like there was one event that happened that got me interested in this. Thanks, Maria. And you mentioned there about most of the, the characters in the books being males and something we've touched on in other women in COG events. And I, I wonder, do you think that now we're in a better place that epidemiologists and science to people and skid, in kids is being shown as a female field or is it still kind of more being portrayed as males? I'm just wondering, are we getting better? Um, and do you think maybe we need to do more in that? I think it's definitely getting better. I think we have a long way to go. Um, you know, I think if you look at public health, it's quite heavily female um, oriented, you know, but in terms of medical professions, and if you look at typical scientists, you know, people look at me all the time. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, you don't, you don't look like a typical scientist. I wonder what a typical scientist actually looks like. I'm not male, you know, I'm not, I don't have white hair. And I don't know if that's what that's supposed to be, but I think any of us, you know, obviously could be scientists. I do see young women and girls getting more into, you know, to STEM and into science, but we need to make it more accessible uh, and available. So I think in a professional, as we get older, it's getting better, but most uh, leadership positions are still men. And then certainly in healthcare, I think it's 75% delivered by women, um, but 25% uh, of women are in leadership positions, something like that. So we, we have a long way to go. And did you find that there were certain role models in, in school or growing up that kind of helped you become a leader and um, like progress your career in science, but also kind of as, as, you, as you gain farther in your career then afterwards? I, I mean, I, I've always, I don't, <laughs> you just said become a leader. I, I think I've kind of fallen into this role in, in this particular pandemic. What I would like is for everyone to see themselves as a leader in no matter what role that you have. I happen to be in a leadership position for this pandemic and in, in leading the technical response on this. The forward facing thing is something that was not planned, but I think all of us should be looking at ourselves in, in leadership positions wherever we are, whether it's our family, whether it's our community, whether it's in our, the job that we have and really act like a leader in that sense. I, I grew up, um, you know, with two parents who were teachers and they in, in upstate New York again. And, you know, in the Northeast, in the U.S., there's there's a really, really strong work ethic and you work, you just work really hard. Um, you you create opportunities, you have opportunities. And I know that that's not true everywhere around the world, but I've always looked up to my teachers. Um, you know, I've always looked up to my professors um, you know, here at WHO, there's a lot of people that I look up to. I mean, I'm so grateful to work with Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Tedros. And, I, you know, I, I draw leader, I draw inspiration from them, but I also draw inspiration from everyone that gets up out of bed every day and, and kind of works on this pandemic, despite complete exhaustion. 
Um, so there's a lot of ways in which I can draw inspiration. There's no one person I would say that kind of, uh, it's a combination. I've been so fortunate to have an amazing family and teachers and yeah, I'm really lucky. Thanks, Maureen. I think that's a wonderful thing to remind everybody here that's listening is that, you know, a leader doesn't need to be someone who's, who's kind of at the front and on the media. Everyone can be a leader in their own way. And I think that's it's a really nice reminder. And thank you for, for, for reminding everybody that I think that's something that we should all remind each other on a, a daily basis. Um, and speaking of hard work, you mentioned about your parents being hardworking, but also I've seen that, you know, you have an amazing education, you know, as Sharon described in your bio. And one of the things that struck me is I know that you did a PhD in avian, um, avian flu and you went to Cambodia. And that, of course, wasn't cheap. You had to work extremely hard to even pay off those fees to do that PhD. And I'm just wondering what made you want to do the PhD, but also what made you want to go to Cambodia and, and focus on that topic and also what, cha what challenges did you face along the way with that as well? So when I finished my master's, um, I did a master's in epidemiology at Stanford University. And it was right at, that was right after college, right after university. Um, and when I finished my master's, I needed to work for a few years to start to, start to pay back student loans. It's a common thing in the US, uh, you have student loans. Um, but I really wanted to kind of get out of education and do something practical and, and applied. You know, what is this degree in epidemiology going to actually do? So I worked for five years at a consulting company in New York. And I learned at that job, it was an engineering, an environmental and engineering consulting firm. Uh, and I did a bit of epidemiology, and, but I worked essentially on my boss's projects, which were around electric and magnetic fields, believe it or not. But in that role... I learned about the weight of the evidence and, and science and, and how you, you know, you take every shred of information and you look at all of the, all of the evidence together in its totality, you weigh it, you look at what's good and what's bad and, you know, what's quality and what's not, and you make an assessment. And that I've, I've taken with me. I also did a little risk communication in that job. Um, but I was ready after five years to go back and do my PhD. Um, and I felt a little bit older. I felt a little bit more I don't know if you could be mature at that age, but I felt a little bit more mature at that age of like, okay, I'm ready to go back to school to be a student again. But I wanted my PhD to be a uh, oppor job opportunity. You know, I wanted to, to get experience while doing my degree. So I was looking for universities that had experience in international health. And at the time in the US, so this was in the early 2000s, at the time, there were a lot of universities that you know, claimed that they did a lot of work in international health, health but they really didn't. They would have you know, a couple of really great professors who did some good work, but I wanted to go somewhere where it was all about international health, all about global health. And so we looked at, um, I looked at LSHTM, and, you know, fell in love with it, obviously. I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. I'm amazed at the network and alumni of LSHTM and um, applied. And I, when I first applied, you know, I had a, a supervisor who initially said to me, um, you know, find an existing data set, analyze it and be done. And I said, that's not what I want. What I want is field experience in doing my degree. Um, anyway, long story short, I ended up getting a new supervisor who is Azra Ghani, who is amazing, who's at Imperial College now. Um, and she was quite helpful in helping me sort of navigate how to, how to create a PhD. And I had the opportunity, I was working on some papers uh, and some analysis and papers with Matthias Borchert on uh, Marburg and Ebola. And he said, if you're interested in emerging diseases, if you're interested in emergency response, you need to meet my colleague, Sarenda Vong, who's based in Cambodia at Institute Pasteur. So I boldly wrote to Sarenda, uh, Dr. Vong, and said, you know, I don't even remember what I said. Here's my name and I'm interested to work with you and I'm not really sure. He wrote back right away and said, all right, you know, you know let's, let's chat. And it, was, and it was quite an opportunistic meeting. So uh, through that collaboration and through working with him, um, and with Azra and with, you know, the school and with Institute Pasteur created this PhD to work in, and do field work in Cambodia. So it was such a wonderful opportunity to do my degree, but actually gain the type of field experience that I wanted and do everything from soup to nuts to designing the 
study to going out and interviewing and working with an incredible group of people in Cambodia, to analyzing it, to writing it up. I even did a little bit of modeling. I'm not a modeler. Um, and it was such, it was life-changing. It was, it was life-changing for me because it just opened my eyes to all of the different things that, that could be done in the field of infectious diseases. I loved it. Thank you, Marie. And I think that's, again, an, another wonderful story about you, you, you started off your PhD and it wasn't the area that you really wanted to go down and you molded it. And I think there's sometimes there's this fear of kind of, you know, going down the way that you want to go down and exploring and, you know, going out of your comfort zone and going, no, that's not what I want to do. I really want to go to this area. And, you know, even by sending the email, now you look back and you see, you know, everything that, that happened after that email by just being, as you said, bold or, and, you know, we could say it has been brave. And I think, you know, that one email and all the encounters that you've had has probably shaped a lot of the steps on your way. So I think it's wonderful to, again, highlight, you know, by just being brave and saying, I want more, I want to go down this area, that it can really shape how we, how we progress our career and also our confidence. You know, even when you talk about your PhD there, you can, you can see by your reaction that it was a really fond memory from, mm -hmm. from a time that you really started to enjoy that feel and experience in Cambodia. So I think, I think it's just a wonderful story. And I think that hopefully a lot of people on this call can resonate with a time they've, they've done something that may not have felt comfortable, um, but at the end, you know, it may have turned out to be something wonderful. So, so thank you for that. Um, I interested to hear what happened after Cambodia, you know, why did you decide to leave? Was there something then that stirred on where to go next? Oh, I mean, I, I ended up coming back from Cambodia because I had to write up uh, the PhD. So I was there for on and off for two years. Um, and I was married at the time. So my, hu well, my husband and I moved over from New York to London, started my PhD. And then I said, oh, I'm going to go to Cambodia and do my field work. And he stayed in London. Um, so we, that's, that's also complicated. I think, you know, and I have a wonderful husband who's been supportive through my entire, entire career. Um, but I came back from Cambodia because I had to finish the PhD. I had to, fin I had to write up. Um, and in finishing the degree and in, in, in writing it up and, and defending and doing the Viva, um, I was asked to do a postdoc at Imperial College. So at my PhD supervisor moved from LSHTM to Imperial College. So I physically moved my office from LSHTM to Imperial while I was still finishing my degree at London School. And so I got to interact with all of these amazing people at LSHTM as well as at Imperial um, in, a, in, a, in a modeling group. I, it was under Neil Ferguson. And um, I'm not a modeler. I'm, I'm a field person. I'm an epidemiologist. I'm a public health professional. Which is, I say that because I was in this group of amazing statisticians and modelers and we weren't quite the same, but we we helped each other in that sense of like real world data fitting into these models. And as I finished the PhD, the 2009 flu pandemic began. And I was asked to do a postdoc uh, at Imperial in which the role was to liaise with WHO, work with staff at WHO to see how the skill set at Imperial in modeling and statistics could support WHO programs. And within the first couple of days, the, the flu pandemic began. So I hopped on a plane and came over here and I joined uh, to support the global influenza program. Um, and I was, I mean, I was here in Geneva for 10 months straight, you know, going back maybe on weekends or not. And it was, it was, again, it was circumstance. Um, and I supported, at the time I was um, coordinating the international modeling network, basically of modelers all over the world and how they can support the, the pandemic and the plans and uh, provide advice to governments on future scenarios of, of, uh, of, of the pandemic. Um, and I just, I don't know, I, I, I fell in love with WHO and what it is and what it's supposed to do and how it works with member states and being part of the United Nations. I mean, I've drunk the Kool-Aid. I'm, I'm wholeheartedly believe in what this organization is meant to do. Um, and on and off uh, had been working with WHO. So through the pandemic, I was here, you know, for a year or two, you know, pretty much straight and go, going back on weekends. Then I had my first baby uh, in 2010, Cole, who's now 11 years old. Uh, and then I just, I started coming less frequently to, to Geneva, but I, my role was to basically go back and forth. 
And together we developed projects on yellow fever, on meningitis, on influenza, on MERS coronavirus. Um, and it just, you know, was just a series of fortunate events, I guess. I mean, the pandemic was certainly not a fortunate event globally, but career-wise, it gave me an opportunity to meet amazing people here and network with people here. Um, yeah. Thank you. There's, there's lots of things I want to discuss in all of this, because there's so many different topics. So I'm going to start with, go back a bit, just that you mentioned about you having, having your first child, Cole, and I believe you've got two, two beautiful yeah. boys. And and I'm sure it's not easy. You've talked about they're having to travel between countries, your husbands and, and then having your kids. And I'm just wondering, how did you find having, you know, that family career life balance in such a busy job? Um, I just want to know if you could share that with people today. Yeah, you just you just do. I mean, as a woman, there's never a good time to have a baby. And whenever you try to find the time to have the baby, it just doesn't work like that. Um, so no matter how much time, how much planning you want to do, things happen. But um, no, I, I mean, you just, I don't know, you, you create the time to do it. I am, I'm uh, an imperfect person. I, I'm, uh, I know you're going to ask me later about sort of work-life balance, but we do the best that we can. All I can say is we do the best that we can. I certainly, it's a challenge. Um, as, you know, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. I have an amazing husband who, you know, took on a lot of the responsibility, particularly with the kids. Um, and we had out when we were in London, we had a, a babysitter who helped us, you know, in the evenings for when I was traveling and whatnot. But you just make it work. And I think as women, we just find ways to make it work. There is no set path. You know, if somebody tells you this is how you're going to have your career and when you're going to have your kids and you could do it at this time, it, it's rubbish. I mean, you just you will make your life the way that I, you make your life. Just choose a good partner um, who respects you and respects what you do and make sure that you have that good communication through it because it's a series of comfort. It's a series of compromises. I have two beautiful, beautiful boys. Uh, Cole is 11 and Miro just turned three. So it's, um, I wish I were with them more. I haven't seen them very much in the last two years. But um, I, I'm, I'm doing my best. Thank you, Marianne. I heard, I heard you speak at a TED Women's Talk recently, and hope you don't mind me quoting, but I heard you quote, you know, your husband said to you when the pandemic hit, I'll do this, you do that. You know, basically, you go save the world. And I think that was just something wonderful to hear that, you know, like you said about creating that supportive network. Um, and I think we are moving to the era that, you know, women can go out and be, you know, lead X in careers and be leaders, it's not easy, um, but it's, it's possible. And I think that was wonderful to hear that support that you got from, from your network around you. And I think, to me, I think you're an incredible role model. I'm sure it's not easy as you've highlighted the challenges. Mm. Um, and, it, you know, but, you know, you, you're doing a wonderful job and everybody on this call and around the world is, is extremely grateful for, for everything that you faced. It's nice of you to say, I mean, I do, I do think we need to be honest that it takes a toll. I mean, we're now entering the third year of this pandemic. So it's, it is quite a challenge of like, how, how can this be maintained? So I'm consciously trying to make sure that I actually make more time at home and not be here all the time. I mean, I think it won't be like this forever. I mean, I keep telling myself it's not going to be like this forever. Um, but this idea of having this perfect work-life balance, I don't think that exists. I think that what we try to do as people, women, men, as, as people, we just try to figure out how you can make the space um, to do your job and to do your job as best to your ability, but also make the time that you you need for the people who love you. And, and I certainly have not gotten that balance right in the last two years. I mean, utter failure utter, absolute utter failure. But I think I recognize that more and more now that I need to just make more time. So it's a, I'm a work in progress. Thanks, Marie. And, and, and again, thank you. I think there's many people around the world who, who've managed to drop that work-life balance for the last two years for reasons which are obvious to everybody. So I think that, you know, hopefully, like you said, we, you know, it's not forever. We can work back towards it. So I'm just really, you know, grateful for you to, to share the the imperfections and the challenges and kind of getting that balance and there's also challenges you face which is the second part that I wanted to come on to is that you know 
you, you had a lot of media attention, of course, in your role with WHO and being the, the COVID technical lead. And I'm sure that hasn't been easy. We see you as a very positive role model, but you've also had to give some really hard messages to people. And, you know, we've seen around the world, sometimes they're, you know, people believe it, some people don't, and there's quite a lot of hesitancy. And especially when we talk about vaccine equity, and I'm just wondering, how did you, how did you feel with all this, you know, that, you know, being on the front face of the media, what challenges have, have you had to overcome? And, you know, is there something that you can share with other people who might get come in that position in, in the future if they're not there already? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole forward facing part of this pandemic was something that wasn't planned. And I did um, my first press conference on the 14th of January, 2020. And I thought that would be my one and only press conference because I was asked to go and, you know, and give an overview. So what do we know? There were, there were 41 cases at the time. And, you know, I was told maybe give some background of other coronaviruses and, and what we may expect, you know, and I had, I had some, what we call talking points, some kind of bullets of major things. I didn't stick to any of those. I basically said, you know, we, here's what we know about coronaviruses. Uh, here's what we know about the current thing, you know, this current novel coronavirus and these cases. And I, I gave some warnings and the headlines from it were, you know, WHO warns all hospitals to be on alert. And it's a pretty good headline looking back now. But at the time, I just thought, oh, gosh, hmm, maybe I won't be asked to do that again. And in being asked to do these, um, I have I, I take this as a huge um, privilege uh, and responsibility. And there's a, there's a lot of work that goes into each one of these. A lot of people say to me, like, you know, do you just show up and just wing it? And I'm like, no, we, we don't show up and just wing it. You know, there's a, there's a lot of preparation. And what I try to do is, is speak about what we know, what we don't know, and what I think is most important, what we're doing with our partners to find out. Because I would like people to know out there that, that there are scientists and experts and public health professionals that are on it. You know, we may not have the answer yet, but there are people who are studying it. And I think that's where my academic background comes in, you know, knowing that there are people that are out there and have these specialties and growing up in, in, in my in my education, in my career, worked collaboratively across disciplines. That to me has been such a such a benefit. So at WHO, we have this convening power. Where we can bring people together at the drop of a hat. To, to bring information before any paper gets published, any presentation gets written, any, you know, any outward, any tweet. Now we're in, now we're in the Twitter world, but, you know, it, we just have that ability. So being a public facing person, I thought my role is to just communicate what needs to be communicated. Um, and I don't, I don't actually have much of a perception of myself outside of my office. I see my office. I see my house. I see a petrol station every once in a while. I mean, we did take a few days off over this last Christmas, but I really have, I have no concept of my um, impact or the impact. Of, I mean, I know what WHO's impact is, but me as a public speaker, I really don't, I really don't see that. What I do see is the negative and on things like social media and, you know, people have my email. So some of the emails I get are pretty awful. Um, you know, vile. It, social media has quite a negative spin, and the negative sticks a lot hard, a lot, a lot. It's a lot stickier than than the positive, and I think much, many more people come out and say negative things before they say positive things. So that's been really hard for me. Um, I think uh, social media is an important medium for us to communicate on. So I, I still choose to use it. I don't have to, of course. Uh, but I just, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not equipped. I don't think any of us in our field are equipped to handle that part of it. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, as we, you know, through our education in public health, a lot of people have had to deal with this, not just me. I wonder if this should be part of the curriculum. You know, how do you, how do you deal with, how do you deal with this? How do you communicate and in a world where science is attacked, where everything is politicized, um, where as a woman, I'm a much easier target than some of my colleagues. And you can see, you know, uh, Mike Ryan and I talk about it all the time. He and I do a lot of things together and what comes to me, what comes to him, he gets his fair share of negative things as well. But it's, it's really amazing how people 
um, I don't know, it, it's been a really negative side of it. I don't want to, I don't want to focus too much on it, but it's been a reality of this and it's, and it's hard. It's been very difficult for me. I'm, I'm not going to lie. And, and Marie, that's something that we haven't talked about in previous Women in Cog. And I think that, you know, it's, it's something we should really take from this one. We've talked about challenges about, you know, women in science. And you've already touched that a bit with yourself and Mike. Sometimes both of you get a hard time, but maybe you get a bit more because you're a female. And, and But I think that training that you mentioned about how to respond and, you know, to cope with that negativity, if it's going to be part of your job and you, you want to do the best that you can, you know, you need to be able to have the skills and the training to be equipped to do this for long term and to, to make it a sustainable career, really, and it's not going to felt, affect your health and well-being. So I think that's something we should really take away from this call and think about what more we can all do to kind of make this a better place and a better career for everybody. I think everybody on the call is quite positive about everything that you've done, but I think that's it's a really important thing that you've raised, and I hope that we can all start to think about what we can do more and how we can promote that positive attitude towards science, but also about what more we can do to, to deal with the negativity. So I'm really, I'm not glad that you, you've you you've been had those horrible comments. I think, you know, I completely disagree with what people are saying that make you feel that way, but I'm really glad that you shared that today so we can think more about what we can do about that. I mean, I think we need to be, I, we, I accept criticism. I accept constructive criticism. I even, some of our fiercest critics, you know, who, who have worked with us, we've, what we call bring into the tent. You know, we bring them in to work with us to make us better. I am not opposed to that. That's not what I'm talking about. But, you know, I'm talking about being accused of murder. You know, I'm talking about what I think we can do, um, you know, as a, as a discipline, as a career, we can help each other. We can reach out to each other and just, I mean, little acts of kindness. I think all of, I mean, I happen to be a forward facing person, but I'm sure many people on this call have been, you know, attacked in ways that, you know, particularly on social media, because there's a, there's a film of anonymity there in some respects, but we don't reach out to each other and say, you know, think about yourselves in the way that you operate in meetings, you know, and how do you comment on a colleague and say, that was a really good idea. You know, even if, even if you don't fully agree with it or, or you think it could be something else, my husband taught me, he did improv when he was, uh, when we were living in New York, he was an improv comedian for a while. And there's a thing that they teach you as an improv, it's called yes and. And when you're in a meeting and you're, or whenever, whenever you're in, it's an adaptation. When somebody says something, even if you completely disagree with it, you say yes and and then even if you change direction, it's yes and, and it's a positive way as opposed to no but. And we live in a culture where everything is, a lot of things are quite negative. But I think even us, even especially as women, we, and sometimes women are really hard on each other, we can create a much more positive environment on that, still challenging each other. I'm not talking about sugarcoating things and making it easier for us, but challenge each other in a positive way. So I think it starts everywhere. It's not just on social media. It's everywhere in everything that we do in our classrooms, in, our, in, the, in the offices and in our social lives. Like we just need to really say the good as well as challenging each other to make us better. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not opposed to criticism, so I don't want it to come across like that. I just think that there's different ways that we can do it. And this pandemic has exacerbated things that have just, you know, they existed far before this pandemic began. Thank you, Marie. And I, I, I definitely don't think that we think you're opposed to criticism. I think, you know, we've seen you respond to criticism quite well, but I think you've, you've really summarized, you know, the issue and how we, how we can do more and essentially to, to be kind and how we respond as yeah. well. So yeah. I'd love to keep talking, but I see the Q&A coming in. So I'm going to take some questions and okay. see if we've got any time for more at the end. Um, so the first question is, many thanks for your time today. You must have experienced many periods of intense pressure and stress. How do you make the time to switch off? And what advice would you have for others to cope with this type of pressure in their roles? And I know we've touched on this. I just didn't know if you wanted to add anything else. Um. <laughs> Not, not particularly well in this pandemic. I have to say that I, the pressure has been uh, extreme um, because of the responsibility that we have. Um, I listen to a lot of music. Um, when I am home with the kids, uh, I, I try to be home on weekends. We try to have what we call pajama days where nobody, we don't have to like get out of our pajamas. And Miro, my little one is really quite little and he's into cars, you know, matchbox cars. So we, we play with those on the floor. Um, and we do a lot of dance parties 
you know, we put music on really, we've always done this. We've always done this, but we put music on really loud and we, and we're, we're so fortunate to live in Geneva. Uh, it's so beautiful here that sometimes my husband says, just get in the car, you know, just like, nope, leave, leave the, leave the computer, you know, get in the car. Um, we try to just, but we're, we're a pretty musical family and listen to that. Um, but the things that we would normally do, you know, take a weekend trip or, you know, we haven't been able to do during this pandemic. We haven't seen our families uh, in a couple of years now. We didn't go back for Christmas. We were supposed to. But I think we'll be a little bit better this year of trying to find ways to kind of alleviate that pressure. Thank you, Maria. Uh, the, the second question um, says, working alongside or working for the WHO has been an absolute dream of mine and, and has been for years. How would you recommend getting experience with the WHO public health in infectious diseases? How can I reach out? And would they accept three to four week work experiences to get a flavor? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, three to four weeks is not enough. Um, you know, we do have an internship program, which I think is on hold for the moment because of the pandemic, because we can't bring people here. Um, we, there's job opportunities at WHO all over the world. Um, if you look on the UN job site, there are positions in, we have a hundred in, we have six regional offices, we have HQ here in Geneva, we have six regional offices around the world and we have 150 country offices. So there's lots of opportunities to get experience, but it, you can't get that in three to four weeks. Uh, you, need, you need at least six months, if not a few years, you know, to really gain that experience. Um, to be fair to you and to be fair to us, I mean, three weeks is nothing to, to be able to to, to, to get something done really. Um, so I would, I would recommend kind of looking at the sites and see what's there, but no matter what people choose in their careers, I would, you know, choose jobs where you can network. Um, because I think in science, a lot of what we do is about networking and reaching out and meeting, meeting more people. It's a pretty small world. I mean, I know everybody's working on COVID-19 now, but in the world of infectious disease epidemiology, it's not, I guess it's pretty massive now, but it wasn't before this pandemic. So you find these networks of people and I, anyone who wants experience, you know, try to make sure that you find that uh, in your next role. Thank you, Maria. I have a, another question, uh, which uh, says, looking back at what you've learned throughout your career, what advice would you have liked to give your younger self? Oh, um, well, I mean, it's funny when you say looking back on my career, because I still feel like I'm still in the beginning of it in, in many respects. What, what advice would I give myself? Oh gosh, sleep more? I don't know. Um, so so many things. I mean, so many things. I, I I'm I'm grateful that I have been able to have opportunities and follow those opportunities and take risks. I think all of us need to take risks. Some of those paid off. Uh, you know, some of them were not quite the right decisions to make. Um, advice. I don't. I, no, I don't. I don't have. I don't have a short answer to that. Sorry. No way. Sleep, sleep is a good one. We'll, we'll put sleep. sleep on the list. Sleep a little bit more. Um, so the next one is more of a compliment. It says, well, it's more a compliment rather than a question to Maria. Speaking from a place who inspires lots of women in Brazil, actually listening to Maria today has inspired me for the amazing professional she is, but especially as a woman and a mother in science. Congratulations. Mm, that's very kind. Thank you so much. And the next one comes from Stephanie. Not a question, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for your honest perspectives and sharing so much today. I think female, I think female empowerment is so important in a working environment. The next one does have a, a question okay. as well. Uh, it has a thank you to start off with. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you for your time today, Maria. Did you receive any media training as part of your role? If so, were there any takeaway messages? Thank you. Ooh, that's a good question. So um, before I did this, no, when we, we do, our, our comms team here um, is really, really fantastic. And they do media training for staff. Um, I did it, I don't know, a year into the pandemic or something. And then I ended up being the one having to ask other people questions, which I actually prefer. I like, I like being the one to have to ask questions. I mean, it, it was kind of training on the job. I mean, we have support from the team here who offer help and we do some practice on particularly, um, let's say last year, uh, a lot of the questions took more of a political, political angle than they do now, although everything now has a political angle to it. 
So we, we do practice, um, especially ahead of some interviews where we know are going to be really challenging. Um, you know, questions around certain people in, in office or the origins of SARS-CoV-2 or, you know, geopolitical. I mean, it's some of, some of the questions, some of the interviews have been particularly difficult. And so we do get some help here of just kind of practicing, you know, what would you say if this was the question? And that, and that is quite helpful. I think advice, uh, on that side, when you answer, it's just be um, direct, um, you know, say what you know, what you don't know, what you're doing to find out. Hum humility, um, speaking with humility that you don't have all the answers. It's not that you're not confident, but it's it's not overconfidence. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm if I'm articulating this the right way, but um, I don't know. I, I think I've just fallen into a pattern where I just answer openly and honestly. And sometimes it really resonates. Sometimes it doesn't. But um, we keep coming back, you know. And if you get it wrong, which I've gotten it wrong. Uh, you know, certainly you come back and you clarify whether the media actually picks that up to say, look, we've corrected something, we misspoke. They don't, that doesn't, that doesn't actually make as much news as when you make the mistake. But I think just keep coming back and, and doing that. It takes practice. It takes practice. Thank, thank you, Maria. I'm going to say a comment from Max and then I'm going to end on a last question because okay. we're almost out of time. So Max says, this is just to say a big, big thank you. Uh, for our passion for equity, for her capacity for analysis and communication and taking on the challenge head on. And the last question comes from Maya, which says, you mentioned social media hate speech as something that is problematic. Now, they asked to list five things, but I know we're almost out of time. So maybe if we can list one major thing that could be done to improve communication and experience on social media. Well, I think people just need to think before they tweet. I mean, you know, just think about if you were to actually say that to someone's face, would you actually tweet it? And if you wouldn't say that to someone's face, don't tweet it. So that's one one big thing. And think before you retweet. So I, you know, there's there's a lot that each of us can do on there, um, and mute the people or block the people who are awful. So. Thank you, Maria. That's the end of our Q and A. I want to say a massive thank you to me. You're you truly are an inspiring role model, and I hope you continue to to shape the COVID response and everything beyond that. So just a really big thank you for sharing your story today. Um, I'm really grateful for everything you've done. I'm gonna hand back to Professor Sharon Peacock now, who's going to give some closing remarks and, and thank you again from me. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to wrap up this fascinating session. And you've given us insights, I think, um, over many topics, I think that will we'll chime with, with our audience, including work-life balance, um, how to be a leader, and the fact that we can all be leaders, um, and dealing with social media, which, which can be very challenging, and small acts of kindness during that period to, to help each other along. I've certainly been inspired by what you've said, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm a huge admirer of what you've done, so a big thank you uh, from, from me too. So a big thank you to, to you, Maria, and also to Catherine uh, for your excellent uh, uh, skills in guiding us through this discussion. Also, thank you to our COG UK uh, organisers, Kim Murray and Sarah. And finally, thanks to the audience very much for coming and listening to us as, uh, talk today. You'll be able to catch up again uh, on this video in about a week's time. If you go to our COG UK website, you'll be able to find a link and listen again and recommend it to your friends. So thank you and goodbye.